Thank you very much for inviting me. A very impressive presentation. We will uh, give you a perspective in the United States, uh, a bit more capitalist uh, system. So telehealth for outpatient physical therapy, particularly spine, had to be developed very quickly. So I'll go through all the nuances, but a uh, very impressive Dr. Bernhardt and Dr. Hill. Uh, learned a lot, appreciate it. And uh, I'll try to incorporate some of those uh, thought processes and ideas on the future for us. Thank you. I will share the screen. Okay, so like I said, we had to develop something very quickly. And this was kind of the end goal for uh, our, our clinics are outpatient. Most of the patients are uh, stable. So they're at, the majority ambulatory and high have everything from lower function post-surgically to higher functions. But the idea was to be able to centralize schedule and actually have coordinated telehealth clinic schedule. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. We wanted to have high capacity. And then very importantly, in the United States, we have a large diversity in uh, languages. And so as you can see, just like the previous professors uh, related, very important to have different languages or translators. So everything from English to Spanish to Vietnamese um, and so forth. You can see the different languages that we have thus far. Um, another thing that was very important to us was to quickly see how we could get the telerehabilitation into a phone because the majority of people are very savvy with cell phones. Even the elderly population can navigate in a cell phone and, and do FaceTime. And so we looked at the information and we decided to use a very simple system and coordinated to the existing EMR. Uh, we had to do this very quickly. So we did look at other systems, but in the United States, you're gonna see that telerehabilitation, uh, at least for outpatient physical therapy, was not well developed. And you'll see some of the barriers why in the next few slides. So as you can see, a large portion of the population in the US either has access to a telephone, a tablet, or a computer. And the idea was to try to mimic and get on cell phones as much as possible. The purposes for us was to extend rehabilitation for outpatient for uh, people that were at high risk, in this case, obviously COVID, but it could be other conditions, ambulatory uh, issues, transportation, also inclement weather. You know, parts of the United States and San Diego, right now I'm wearing shorts, you can't see them. But in other parts of the United States, you could have ice, you could have a lot of snow and a lot of inclement weather issues. Also government mandates, you know, the United States is still under quarantine. Um, and as many countries, the quarantine was uh, strict unless you're a healthcare provider or an essential business but most of our patients had pretty strict quarantine. And then clinic closures. Uh, many clinics closed in the United States, physical therapists, uh, particularly smaller clinics or people who weren't clear with the laws. You know, some of the laws were not very clear. Some of the mandates were very quick. I would assume the same thing happened in many countries. Another thing that was very important to us is we wanted to do something that was value driven. We wanted to make sure that it was distinct and different. We knew it was going to be different from the clinic setting. And so we started looking at our therapists and I did the therapist that would be well better suited for delivering this model. And we started developing systems and training. And the idea was to assess the patients, devise a plan to improve their overall function and complete the activity of daily living, their ADLs. 
simplify what we try to do. We do evaluations, we educate, we advise. But also, you'll see this and also in my following presentation, the physical therapists can triage for the different specialists. And that was important, and I'll bring this up again because it's such importance. Remember, the idea with COVID and the pandemic is not to overwhelm the hospitals. And many of the hospitals, particularly in New York and California, and many of the healthcare systems became basically uh, strictly operating mainly for COVID. And so a lot of the wards, a lot of the uh, services that were provided at the hospital were only done for emergencies. So ancillary, service, ancillary surgeries were not performed. So unless you had a very major dysfunction with an ACL or a spine or shoulder, you would not receive surgery during the quarantine. Uh, again, unless it was an emergency. And so physical therapists could help triage some of this and that, that also helped keep patients outside the hospital system. And that was a very important clue. And that's why in part, physical therapists are considered a, an essential uh, worker, healthcare worker. We also did inclusion exclusion criteria. So basically, we did diagnoses, severity, and then that triage system we talked about. We did, uh, we see acute conditions. So somebody who herniated a disc uh, a day before or a week before, all the way to people who are at a higher level, and then uh, pre and post surgical conditions. A to Z, uh, we see hand, we have occupational therapists, shoulder, knees, spine, uh, pretty much anything that's orthopedically related. Again, if it's something that has to do with uh, not outpatient orthopedic, then that would be triage and we would try to manage that and refer to the appropriate specialists. Okay, so uh, simplified. Uh, what we did is we wanted to look at remote delivery and we developed a scheduling system by law and the way that we bill, uh, and we'll talk about that shortly. We needed to have a telehealth clinic within the uh, electronic medical records. And that's how it's ID'd as a tele-rehabilitation system. So we needed to make sure we integrated that into a scheduling system because it's very important to coordinate and so we would make sure that we called uh, maybe the day before or at least 10 minutes before the session to make sure we would resolve any connectivity issues. And we'll talk about that. But um, in many cases, either we had issues at the clinic level and one simple solution was to make sure that we had hard cable hookup to the computers that were doing telehealth and that was very helpful. And then obviously we had a lot of issues or not a lot, but some issues, with patients at their home. We didn't have a lot of control over what the patients had. So we had to have um, this 10 minute session to make sure also that that individual could operate. You know, we have some elderly patients. And you'd be surprised, we have patients that are in the 80s and 90s, and if they couldn't use the phone or they couldn't use some of the systems, we would try to get a family member or somebody to assist. But I would say the mass, the vast majority, we've been able to accommodate. Um, we talked about privacy, or the professors uh, before talked about privacy. Um, in the United States, a lot of things got relaxed. The government basically said, look, you don't need to worry about privacy issues right now. We have a pandemic. You don't have to worry about uh, sensitive information. But we went ahead and did that anyway. So our systems are HIPAA compliant. So it, it, it's very safe and very encrypted. Also, we do provide an informed consent prior to treating the patient to let the patient know and inform them of the limitations of this type of treatment and that there are some risks, albeit small, uh, but it's the uh, standardized way that we treat in the outpatient. And so, um, you know, eventually, hopefully the pandemic and will be resolved and telehealth we hope will continue and flourish. And therefore it was important for us to make sure that we followed all the secure and uh, typical things that we use in outpatient as well. Um, so we didn't follow the government mandate on that one. 
Appointment reminders, very important to remind the patient, get them set up, um, and then make sure we communicate. And then documentation was very simple. We use our existing AMR, and I'll show you why. And uh, We had to get this uh, up and going very, very quickly. We did it in 21 days. And then we also measure patient satisfaction and get the patient's input, and that's integrated into the EMR, which is essential because you want to get feedback. You want to be able to integrate that into your treatment plan of care. Patient satisfaction is very important. Patient beliefs about their treatment is important. And that needs to be discussed with the therapist and both have to have a good dialogue. So, you know, the uh, telehealth services are very similar to what we discussed earlier, but obviously we can do evaluations if we've never seen the patient. We do risk assessment and triage. We discuss that and we'll talk about that a little bit more in length. Uh, very important to discuss expectation to recover. You know, if they hurt their back, assure them they're nervous, they're scared. But pain isn't necessarily bad. It's going to tell them what they can't do, but eventually we're going to want to do some of those functions. And let them know in 90 days, the vast majority of people recover. We know you're in a lot of pain right now. That's okay. But you will recover because we know 80%, 90% of people recover with back pain within three months. Um, and you can tell them expectations for a rotator cuff surgery. You can tell them expectations for an ACL reconstruction, whatever the body part. Um, we do special tests. Uh, we'll talk about some of that as well. We do exercise and movement review. Um, and then we do synchronous. Uh, we'll do the exercise program with the patient, very functional. And then we also do asynchronous where we send videos for back pain or videos for whatever the body part to educate them and provide expectations in addition to the uh, synchronous uh, communication. And then also we provide home exercise programs, so videos, handouts, and so forth. And the patient can interact and ask questions asynchronously. Um, they can also send their video to see what their form is and performance and also trying to uh, keep track of compliance. And remember in the previous slides and also, I think it was one of the questions on the panel, which was answered very well, but um, believe it or not, you get no-shows with tele-rehab. So even though we set up the communication, we set everything up and the patient isn't there. How does that happen? But um, we have about a 15% no-show or cancellation rate. And so that's why it's very important to try to send reminders and set everything up properly. Um, we do motivation, and we'll talk about that a lot. And then we have recently incorporated outcome measures. So this presentation I wrote a little bit earlier, and now we've completed a lot of those tasks. So this is the way we developed it, because again, in the US, um, at least in the outpatient and in the private world, um, there wasn't a lot of information or there wasn't anything that we had existing to provide telehealth. So we had a little bit of a disadvantage, but we developed a task force, including myself and a lot of other smarter people, um, including people in billing, uh, people in IT, business development professionals, and also the, a lot of the physical therapists and occupational therapists. We started to meet weekly. We assessed the needs. And then we looked at the scientific literature. Uh, by the way, in outpatient, there isn't much. There's very scant literature on outpatient telerehabilitation. I'm a researcher. Um, there's got to, hopefully there's going to be a lot more and uh, thank to all the researchers that are working on this. Uh, we did uh, focus groups and conducted meetings and then we developed a standard operating plan with the task force. And then we went ahead and ratified this with our board and we started telehealth pretty immediately. From there we did internal pilot testing. So again, this is very rudimentary. It wasn't developed. That's where we found out the connectivity issues. We found out that it was better to set up a 10 minute appointment before or call the day before, make sure the systems were working. We looked at all the revisions and then we rolled it out. Um, I think we did about 25 or so trials before we rolled it out. And then we did a system-wide launch. Um, and you know, every 
every week we continue to improve and see what deficits we have and what other things we had. Particularly, we're adding a lot of asynchronous materials. So we've had steady growth. We do about 900 uh, visits per month right now. Anywhere from people who are in quarantine awaiting their COVID tests. You know, we have over 2 million people infected in the United States at present. To people who recovered, who they still can't attend clinics. To people at high risk, you know, they're over 65. Or some people that are fearful. And uh, to be clear, in California, physical therapists could be open during COVID. But the volume was much, much lower because you didn't want to put people at risk who had very simple uh, rehabilitation needs. You didn't want those individuals going to the clinic, but you did want somebody who, for example, had a knee replacement and they were having issues with that knee replacement. Or it was the knee replacement was done right before the COVID epidemic and they're not moving or their shoulder or whatnot. So we did have some uh, strict criteria that we had to uh, use and then look at case per case basis. So we, we have about 30 licensed physical therapists. Now we have over 100 in the company, but the 30 that we're using now are therapists that uh, we ID as therapists that could deliver this and we train them. We're also training other staff and now we incorporate it into our student mentorship program because we do have students and clinical interns that come in. And so we incorporated telehealth because we see it as a viable mean in the future and something that's going to be important for the profession and to help patients long term. And then, of course, we talked about the different languages. Um, we don't have to go through all the slide, but the biggest motivation in the United States was financial. You know, uh, phys physical therapy telehealth for outpatient was not paid by any government payer by any insurance company. Right around April, look at how fast it occurred. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, which are more of the socialized programs for the elderly here, uh, decided they would pay for telehealth. And then eventually they would pay at the same rate. And then very quickly in May, uh, think about it, this is May, this <laughs> last month, workers' compensation, so injured workers, uh, the insurance companies would pay the same as an inpatient visit. And so obviously there was motivation. Now, just to let you know, we started telehealth and our thought process was even if we don't get paid, we owe it to our patients and we would keep the uh, visit short at that point. Now they're time-based, but to make sure that we would keep the patient informed and make sure that their treatment would go on because when COVID was over, again, being, uh, for profit organization, we wanted those patients back and wanted to make sure they weren't left out and not treated. Thankfully, though, the government decided to pay for telehealth, at least for now. Um, so, you know, post COVID, we anticipate that the telerehabilitation will be reimbursed, but likely at a lesser rate. That's our prediction. And there's probably going to be categories and different inclusion exclusion criteria that will be developed on the other hand while you know the pandemic um, kind of forced uh, these changes it does suggest acceptance and perceived value of outpatient physical therapy otherwise it wouldn't uh, they wouldn't offer to pay these services and you know anecdotally things look to be moving forward in a positive direction here's a patient feedback um, it's hard to see a little bit, but you'll see that uh, we're quite surprised. And right now we're gathering the data, both from the outcome tools and from the patient feedback, hopefully uh, eventually publish. But as you can, uh, most of the information that we've gotten is extremely positive. Net promoter scores are scores used in the industry and for physical therapy and 83% is a high score, uh, you know, world-class so forth. This is used like with the Four Seasons, uh, Ritz Carlton, bigger organizations to look at satisfaction. Now we use this and we also use and look at any negative comments. Most of the negative comments that we've gotten in telehealth was <clears throat> connectivity issues and things like that. But overwhelming right now, things are very positive on the comments and 
Uh, it's a little bit too early to tell in the outcome tools. We just started implementing those and then the second presentation we'll talk about that. But definitely telehealth has been something that's been extremely helpful for the pandemic. And also we hope that it will evolve and develop and be here to stay. So thank you, that's the, that's the presentation. If you look at the next steps, we're looking at uh, adding videos. We already did that. Actually, all these things we've done so far, except we have not analyzed data. We still need to collect much data for several months. And then we're continually going to be improving the quality and hopefully publishing more frequently. Here's a contact information if you have any questions and acknowledgements. You know, this is not a one person quest, this is a team. And I really want to thank all the therapists who really made this possible, all the staff and our tele telehealth task. Thank you.